Let us lift up our two hands to heaven and one more time just worship his majesty. Exalt his name, lift him up on high. He's alive forever. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. Lord, once again tonight, speak to us in your love. Let your, let your love locate each of us in our place of destiny. Amen. Cleanse us. Refresh us. Refire us. And receive us. In Jesus' name. Please, you may be seated. We'll be looking at the power of the conscience in part two. And today we'll be focusing on cultivating a healthy conscience. Or growing a great conscience. We tried last Sunday or last Thursday to define what the conscience represents, what it means. And among other things, we said that your conscience is the invisible you that determines what becomes of the visible you. It is that you that cannot be seen by any man, but it is the you that determines what the you that can be seen becomes. It is your confidential companion. It is the you that only you can relate with. It is your God ordained policeman. Its mission is to police your destiny unto dignity. You don't have to be a Christian to have a conscience, but being a Christian helps to keep your conscience alive. You don't have to be a Christian to have a conscience, but being a Christian helps your conscience to stay alive. Its mission is to promote honesty and godly sincerity. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 18. Or let's start from 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we've had a conversation in the world and more abundantly to you world. So the testimony of your conscience is godly sincerity. So if your conscience is alive, it promotes godly sincerity in your work, your way of life. Godly sincerity. The testimony of our conscience 
is godly sincerity. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 18, it talks about the ministry or the mission of a good conscience. He said, verse 18, pray for us, for we trust that we have what? A good conscience. In all things, willing to live honestly. In all things, willing to live honestly. That is the testimony of a good conscience. Willing to live honestly in all things. Willing to live honestly in all things. That is the testimony of a good conscience. And those two scriptures, I believe, summarize what the ministry of the conscience is. And like I said, the healthier your conscience, the higher you fly. Paul the Apostle, one of the highest flyers in the ministry of the gospel, was a man of a good conscience. In Acts chapter 23, verse 1, he said, I have lived in all good conscience until this day. I've lived in all good conscience. So the healthier your conscience, the higher you fly. So with a dead conscience, your destiny is doomed. With a dead conscience, every destiny is doomed. There are people, even if you put knife on their neck, they will still lie. If you get a knife and place on their neck and say, I'm going to kill you, kill me, I will die a liar. Conscience is dead. I had the most miserable experience um, this uh, week. And it's... Uh, they said to this young person, tell the truth. He said, no, how can I say what I've not done? Tell the truth. I said, look. <laughs> I, I saw you myself. He said, it's not me. Ah. <laughs> Amen. Conscience. Your most awesome companion. Conscience, your invisible confidant. It represents the life wire of every destiny. It's my prayer that this month of perfection, every dead conscience will come out of the grave. That's what the conscience represents. What does it take now to develop a healthy conscience? What does it take to cultivate a great conscience? Paul the Apostle said, um, and I mentioned that briefly last Thursday, he said, and herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience that is void of offense both towards God and towards man. Acts chapter 24 verse 16 And herein do I exercise myself So we need to be able to look at this word exercise What does this exercise entail? What was he doing to keep his conscience alive? Herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience That is void of offense Both towards God and towards man so what was he doing? What was the type of exercise? You see, some day, sometime I was in the hotel and I saw some people practicing swimming or exercising themselves for swimming. And so they took their leg like this and they leap around according to the demands of their game. And I said, what's happening? Now, he's subjecting his limbs to stress so that you can see how long it can sustain you when you are swimming 
And after they've gone down with one leg, they take the other leg. So the legs are used to being suspended. So when it's time to swim, he can flap comfortably without dropping like a stone. So what kind of exercise? The exercise you require to play football is not the kind you require to play basketball. What was Paul doing that kept his spirit man or his conscience alive? And we look at that from quite a number of scriptures. Paul the apostle said, or Jude was writing, and he said, we read from Jude verse 20. Jude verse 20. That is the last book to Revelation. That's the book before Revelation. It's only one chapter. Jude verse 20. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying what? In the Holy Ghost. How do you build up on your most holy faith? Praying in the Holy Ghost. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I speak with tongues more than ye all. So Paul was a tongue praying saint. He was using the ministry of praying in tongues to keep his conscience alive. Now listen, as you pray in tongue, it's like you are setting fire into your system. And that fire burns off every chaff. Burns off every chaff. So if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have that God-given advantage to refine your spirit man, refine your mind, refine your conscience by praying in the Holy Ghost. Is someone hearing what I'm saying? Now you can't build up on the faith without conscience. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, holding faith and what? And a good conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19. This is what it says. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some haven't put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So if praying in tongues builds up your faith, your most holy faith, that means praying in tongues helps to keep your conscience alive. Because without a good conscience, you make a shipwreck of your faith. So if praying in tongues keeps your conscience, builds up your faith, then praying in tongues must be a device for keeping your conscience alive. Does that make sense to anyone? Does that make sense to anyone? Praying in tongues is not reserved for church services. Praying in tongues is not reserved for winner satellite fellowship operations. Praying in tongues is not reserved for praying for the sick. Praying in tongues is a device to keep you alive in God. Among other things. Paul said, I pray with tongues more than ye all. I pray with tongues more than ye all. And the word says, building up yourself upon your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is the refiner's fire. What is it? So praying in the Holy Ghost is just setting the refiner fires on in your life. And the Bible said he has a fan in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He will gather the chaff and burn them with unquenchable fire. So when you are praying in the Holy Spirit, you are setting up the refiner's fire. It burns off every chaff in your system, your conscience, your mind, your spirit. So you can maintain a very sound walk with God. Can I hear your amen? Can I hear your amen? 
Can I hear your amen? Can I hear your amen? This is very, very important. Paul said, I pray with tongues. I speak with tongues more than ye all. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 18. First Corinthians 14, 18. And the secret of men is in their stories. So if he prayed in tongues more than them all, no wonder he stayed more alive than them all. So it's time to pray in the spirit. I say it's time to pray in the spirit. It's time to spend time in, in God's presence praying in the Holy Ghost. Waging a holy war against everything that corrupts and pollutes. I pray with tongues more than ye all. I love that. And if you look at it here, he said, If I pray in an unknown tongue, verse 14, my spirit prayeth. My spirit what? Yes. But my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I pray, I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. As when thou blessed with the spirit, how shall they which occupy the room of the unland say, Amen? Are thy giving of thanks? Seeing he understandeth not what thou seest. For thou verily giveth thanks, but the other is not edified. I thank God that I speak with tongues more than ye all. Your spirit is praying. And no one knows the things of a man, but the spirit of man that is in him. So your spirit is praying for God to step in in areas of your life that needs attention. It's so important. So Paul was exercising himself and praying in the Holy Ghost. And here I need to exercise myself to always have a conscience that is void of offense both towards God and towards man. I don't want to make a shipwreck of my faith. So I pray in the Holy Ghost to keep my life, my, my conscience alive. Can I hear your amen? amen? Does it make sense to you now? So if you are born again and you have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with tongues, you are limited in your work with God. And those of us who are baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues, it is not a decoration for church service. It's not a show of spirituality. It's a weapon of war. It is God's wisdom for winning your impossible wars. Impossible in court. Amen. What was Paul doing? He was praying in the Holy Ghost. Thereby building up himself upon his most holy faith. Setting the definer's fire aflame burning off every chaff in his system and keeping his conscience alive. Can I hear your amen? amen? Acts chapter 2 I mean chapter 20 Acts chapter 20 and verse 32 What was Paul doing or what does it take to build a great conscience a great Christian life a great Christian personality Paul was writing here in Acts 20 and verse 32. Somebody is breaking forth into a new realm altogether today. If you are that one, let me hear your loud amen. Acts 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. How do you build up? Which is able to build you up and to give your own inheritance among them which are sanctified. So, he said, I recommend the word of God for you. It is the only way to build up. So you can become a partaker of your inheritance which only the sanctified can assess. I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give your own inheritance among them which are sanctified 
Your inheritance requires sanctification. And the word of God is a sanctifier. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17 verse 17. I commend you to God and to his word. It's able to build you up. Body, soul, spirit, conscience. So you can become a partaker of your own inheritance among them which are sanctified. So Paul was a word addict. Come and say word addict. When you become addicted to the truth, your conscience will stay alive. Paul was addicted to the truth. He carried books about, made notes again and again. He was feeding fast, fat, continually on the truth. No wonder I said I've lived in all good conscience until this day. I've lived with all good conscience until this day. I'm sure you are all aware. The Bible said that thou mightest cleanse them by the washing of water by the word of God. Ephesians 5:26. So God's word is a cleansing device. Come and say cleansing device. God's word is a cleansing device. So the more exposed you are to the truth, the brighter your life becomes. In Psalm 119, verse 9 to 11. Psalm 119 and verse 9 to 11. I'd like to read that briefly. Psalm 119 and verse 9 to 11. We are whither shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. Where? How can he make it happen? By taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word is God's device for keeping you and me alive and keeping our conscience alive. God's word. It is an avenue through which we partake of the divine nature. Come and say divine nature. Now if you look at um, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Wherefore, or whereby are given unto us these exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we partake of the divine nature through encounters in the word of God. The word you encounter determine the dimension of the divine nature you partake of. We partake of that. The divine nature. And the more of his nature you imbibe the more of him you display. God is a holy God. So the more of him you take on, the more of his holiness you demonstrate. And the, the more your conscience comes alive. It's so important. That's why I said I commend you to God. He said, let me show you my secret. I partake of my inheritance via encounters in the word of God that makes me imbibe divine nature which naturally qualifies me for whatever belongs to me in God. May this month be your month of great qualification. May everything that disqualifies anyone here from his inheritance give way this month. The 
This is very important. So God's word is the only way to become truly spiritual. Too many religious people mistake religiosity for spirituality. They are two different things. Religion has to do with forms, rules and regulations. But spirituality in this context has to do with the, de the development of your spirit man. There is no way you can pray a man into strength. A man has to feed before he can become strong. So true, true, true spirituality has to do with the quality of feeding that you engage in in the word of God. It's not just being around. It's not just being active. It is being connected, being rooted in the truth. So a spiritual man is not one who knows the truth, but one who lives the truth. Amen. I say it's not one who knows the truth, but one who lives the truth. Now the word you know only informs you. It is the word that you do that transforms you. Is someone getting what I'm talking about? The word you know only informs you. It is the word that you do that transforms you. Doing the word is what turns it to food. Knowing the word only delivers the letters. It is doing the word that communicates the life. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Now, Jesus said, I have a meat to eat that you don't know nothing about. And he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So God's word becomes food when you begin to put it to work. Now listen, somebody knows about tight. And now we open you windows of heaven. And in fact, he preaches it. But he's not doing it. He's only an orator and an entertainer. Because <laughs> saying it, preaching it, quoting it, is not equal to food. It's a celebration of letters. It is doing it that turns it into food. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? Does it make sense to you now? So a spiritual man is not one who preaches the truth, but one who practices the truth. It is not biblical teaching that makes a spiritual man. It is biblical practice. It is biblical practice that makes a spiritual man. A spiritual man is not just one who prays to God. A spiritual man is one who portrays God in his daily work. He portrays God. Come and say portrays. This is very important. So word practice is an exercise that we have to engage in all the days of your life. You find it and you fix it. You find it and you fix it. That's where the exercise is. You find it and say, no boy, you are wrong. Then you fix yourself in line with his word. Find it and fix it. That is the greatest exercise in a spiritual journey. Find it and fix it. Find it and fix it. Find it and fix it. Number three exercise that Paul was involved in. 
We read from Second Corinthians chapter 6 and beginning from verse 14. It's an age long truth, but it's ever, ever working. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has lie with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, verse 17, let's read together. Let's go. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, verse 1 of chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Wherefore come ye from among them. You cannot build a great conscience keeping a wrong company. He that walks with the wise shall be wise. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13 and verse 20. You can't keep your walk with God having unbelievers as your best of friends. You can't. It's a risk. You sell your battery before you know it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, the word says, Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. No matter how anointed, no matter how insightful, no matter how intelligent, no matter how smart, evil communication corrupts good manners. Your conscience can become polluted overnight. I'm sure we are all aware of the psalm of the blessed man. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But whose delight is in the law of his God, and upon it he doth meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. <laughs> his leaves also shall not wither. And whatever he doeth, he shall prosper. Psalm 1 and verse 1 to 3. He does not stand in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit with the scornful. But his delight is in the law of his God. So his conscience is kept alive by not mixing in wrong places. Exercise. My son, when sinners entice you, consent not. Exercise. I believe these three constitute part of the exercises I believe that Paul was involved in in keeping his conscience alive. And everyone needs it. Everyone needs it. To keep the refiner's fire aflame by praying in tongues, to stand strong in word practice, and not be celebrating revelations without proofs. It is the practice of the truth that gives it its correct value. Any man that hears these words of mine and do and do with them, Jesus said, I would like him unto a wise man who is beaten out upon the rock. And then come the rain and the storm and the wind against that house 
and it could not fall because it was founded upon the rock. But whosoever hear the sayings of man and doeth them not, I like him unto a foolish man who is built his house upon the rock or upon the sand. And then came the storm, the wind, and the rain. And great was the fall of that house. No one will have that kind of experience in his journey. And herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience that is void of offense both towards God and towards man. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness for bodily exercise profited little but godly exercise is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life which now is and the one which is to come. That is through this exercise you can give value to your destiny. You can give value to your destiny. There are people you are working with today that in no time you discover you have been stripped naked. Your destiny is gone. They have made you to say what must not be said and they have made you to enter where you must not enter. And at the end of the day, the crown is gone. Your crown will not be gone. Yeah. Whatever does not make you see this book as a manual is a deception of the devil to get you out of your inheritance. This is the manual of destiny. Whatever this book commands is the only way to get to where you are going. And praying in tongues keeps your conscience alive by burning of every chaff by the refiner's fire. Stand to your feet. Somebody alive here today? Come and give Jesus a big big hand. He's alive. Hallelujah. Say with me, the healthier my conscience, the higher I fly. So help me, Lord. The healthier my conscience, the higher I fly. So help me, Lord. The healthier my conscience, the higher I fly. So help me, Lord. The healthier my conscience, the higher I fly. So help me, Lord. Why do we need this exercise? To maintain a goodly conscience, you may have to pay some price in suffering. And what? In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 19 Which I refer to last Thursday He said it is thank worthy If a man for conscience towards God Suffers grief Come and say thank worthy That is to maintain a goodly conscience towards God You suffer grief wrongfully it is thankworthy. Why? Because at the end of the rope is triumph. And he said the affliction of now which is but for a moment cannot be compared with the weight of glory that shall be revealed. That's why you need the exercise. Why do you need the exercise? One by one someday we shall stand before the judgment throne. Romans 14, 12. One by one, someday, we'll stand before the judgment throne. That's why the exercise is, in, is needed. And if only on this earth we have profit, then we are most of all men miserable. First Corinthians 15, verse 19. That's why we need the exercise. I'd like you to lift up your hands and receive grace 
for tireless exercise towards maintaining a healthy conscience. Take that from the law right now. Take that from the law right now. Receive grace for tireless exercise towards maintaining a healthy conscience. Receive that grace. Receive that grace for a tireless exercise towards maintaining a healthy conscience. Receive that grace from the Lord. I receive that grace from you today, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. I'd like you to pray in the spirit. And see yourself setting up the refiner's fire. For a unique ministry. Throughout your entire system. Would you pray right now? Oh, sing la crete molotosia. Ye shala prekteno pita sino. Ye shali anda proctene brodia. Ziza rakatano. Enda piri ande shalito. Mita kreria. Wiri ande shali anda paro tapane tesil. Umalata sizoria. Mengle rika la braktano brodia. Iza zito kronklebo peliriande. Ziza recto lo porute. Ye shall glad a condiam balota sea. One belecretino prentene boruda yet an up. Is a balato sulia. Ropecate a proctene poruta seal. Ye shall a barante, seno proctonia. Imporoto suza reco lambara de yalo. E parata singlo rotopoloto sea. Ye shanda canapalos. Empoloto sea, lempoloto sea. Ye shall a barato. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name. Just before we partake of the communion, we are also told in scriptures that the blood of Jesus is able to purge our conscience free from dead works so we can serve the living God. By this blood tonight, Whatever represents dead work in everyone's conscience is purged in the name of Jesus. Whatever represents dead works in everyone's conscience is turned to a testimony in the name of Jesus. This is a month of new beginnings. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'd like you to know that every prophetic word in this commission is always on target. Every prophetic word in this commission is always on target. May it hit you correctly this year. Every prophetic word in this commission is always on target. Every. Every. 
May you be a living testimony of the prophetic word for the year 2003. Just like it is for the year, so it is for the month. May you become a living proof of the prophetic word for this month in the name of Jesus. Every prophetic word in this commission is always on target. This year, nothing will make you miss the proof of the prophetic word for the year. Remember, on Sunday, we'll be here for our unusual Thanksgiving and children education service. And we'll be bringing also this series of teachings to a close. And I can see a prophetic seal upon your life coming to abide there forever. After this month, it will be said of you, the prince of this world came to me and has not any mail. This month will be to each one of us that month of new beginnings. The presence of God will envelope you beyond your widest imagination beginning from this month. And at the end of this year, you will exemplify practical dominion. So shall it be. Lift up those beautiful hands before the Lord. Go in peace. Demonstrate the validity of the prophetic word for this month every day of your life. Grace for perfection in our walk with God is released today in the name of Jesus. Every dead work is purged from our conscience by the blood of Jesus that we are partaking of now in Jesus' name. Return this to this place on Sunday with a lively testimony on your tongues. So shall it be. In Jesus' name. Let's share the goodness in fellowship. Surely, goodness.